Hey guys, it's Camille, and this is Kitchen House Coffee. It's one of my favorite places in St. Louis. So many of you longtime listeners know that I'm not from here, and when I came, I didn't really know where to live, so I asked a bunch of people for recommendations. They gave me a list, I picked a place, and I moved in. What I quickly realized, though, was that I was in kind of one of these special pockets in St. Louis, an area in a highly segregated city that wasn't so segregated, a neighborhood called Tower Grove East. And specifically, a couple days after I rolled in, I found myself here at the coffee shop. It was only a couple blocks away from my apartment. It's an adorable little neighborhood hangout. They've got great food and delicious tea, which I try to have every morning. And I mean, there's chickens in the back. Who doesn't love chickens? Anyway, it's great. Tim, you and I come here often. Yeah, we have meetings here, workshop stories, that kind of stuff. And it's a little like the neighborhood itself where there's all kinds of people who walk through the door. Totally. This is why a lot of people love Tower Grove East. Because you have a diverse group of people. You know, so many walks of life. This is the voice of a woman Tim and I met a few months back. Hi, my name is Fredika Mitchell, and I live in Tower Grove. I used to live in Tower Grove East. I currently live in Dutchtown in South St. Louis City. Fredika and I didn't know it, but we used to live right around the corner from each other. Like me, she's since moved to a different neighborhood in St. Louis. And she recently invited us over to check out her new place. Cool. Look, I'm still working on it. Yeah, I hear you. But I mean, look, it's a cool place, though. Yeah, it is. Like, I the love bones it. of it are nice. Like, I love now, it. I wish I could tell you this is just the story of a couple of strangers meeting and reminiscing about their beloved old neighborhood. It's not. Fredika reveals to us a darker side of Tower Grove East. I, I feel like I was pressure to move where I was at. I was, it wasn't safe for me anymore. It was not safe for my children anymore. Um, mentally and stress-wise, it, it just, it became to be too much. Fredika says she didn't always feel this way about Tower Grove East, and the first few months were great. It was nice and comfortable, but as it got warm, you know, more people would come out into the neighborhood. And I remember one particular moment where I was giving my son a bath and um, I had the door cracked. And he was young. He was really young. And I put on his uh, underpants and he ran out the door, the front door. And I ran after him to bring him inside of the house. And I a knock. I heard a knock at the door, and it was the police. They said, uh, someone called and said that there's a young child running around the neighborhood naked, unsupervised. And I thought to myself, what? A couple of weeks later, got another call from the, uh, the police came to my home again. And they were saying that kids were in the street unsupervised, screaming at the top of their lungs, and they're always out after hours, you know, stuff like that. that that's when the phone calls began, you know, and I started getting visits from the city. Fredika's neighbors in this slowly gentrifying part of St. Louis were making some wild claims. They accused the mother of five of running an illegal daycare out of her own home, they outed Fredika on Facebook as someone who used a Section 8 housing voucher. They called her and anyone who visited her suspicious. City officials never substantiated any of the claims. This went on for six years. I mean, six years? Six years. It got so bad that Fredika's landlord sold the building because he was tired of the harassment. But because of the sheer number of service and police calls generated to her home, she was slapped with the label, being a public nuisance. It, 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 it was just, it was crazy. I, I had no peace. Now, it would be easy to think that maybe Fredika just got stuck with some really, 
really bad neighbors. But that would ignore what many people say is a systemic attempt by many cities to sift through who they do and don't want in their communities. They do it by using nuisance ordinances, which are basically local laws that govern things like trashy lots and noise violations. Nuisance ordinances aren't uncommon. As a reporter in Florida, I remember a town using its law to shut down a rowdy nightclub. But there's been a shift in recent years to use these laws against people as well as businesses. What's more, housing advocates and legal experts say these nuisance laws often target specific groups of people. Black people, poor people, people with disabilities and mental health issues, and domestic violence victims. And the St. Louis region, they say, is leading the pack. This is something that happens a lot in our community amongst, from my experience, the people that I've talked to amongst African Americans. I've been through so much hell mm -hmm. coming from Tower Grove East. You know, I thank God that he blessed me to be able to come here and have peace, you know, because I, I wouldn't be able to take it, you know, to come move. I was just saying when I was looking for places, I said, Lord, I don't want to be nowhere where folks don't want black folks. So on today's show, we explore just what happens when communities label a big chunk of their citizens, often poor, black, disabled, and battered, as public nuisances. And we wade into the fight against these laws. From St. Louis Public Radio and PRX, this is We Live Here. A show for people somewhere on the woke spectrum. There may be as many as a thousand of these nuisance ordinances across the country. Some are in big cities like St. Louis, but small communities have them too, like here in Maplewood, Missouri. It's a beautiful spring afternoon, and Tim and I are strolling down the main drag. It used to be a section of Route 66. There's a lot of cute little shops and restaurants, and one of the area's most celebrated brewery takes up an entire city block. People here also rave about the schools. I mean, honestly, it's kind of like my old neighborhood, Tower Grove East, for suburbanites. Yeah, but we should say that behind this leafy veneer of cuteness, uh, this town's facing some pretty serious allegations right now. Yeah, according to some, the St. Louis suburb of about 8,000 people has one of the nation's most stringent nuisance laws. And it so happened that we discovered that Maplewood, Missouri has perhaps perhaps the worst. Sasha Sandberg Champion is a civil rights attorney in Washington, D.C. He tracks these ordinances at the national level. What Maplewood does is it says if you want to live in Maplewood, you have to get something that it calls an occupancy permit. So you actually have to apply for permission to live there. And then if uh, under its nuisance ordinance, if two or more police calls are associated with you, the town can actually hold a hearing and then revoke your occupancy permit, and that effectively expels you from town. And Sasha says Maplewood has kicked a lot of folks out of town illegally, including suicidal residents and victims of domestic violence who, according to the ordinance, called for help too many times. When I moved out there, I didn't have to look over my shoulder. This is Rosetta Watson. In 2010, the city of Maplewood issued her an occupancy permit. And when I moved to Maplewood, I didn't think I had to look over my shoulder. She found an apartment to rent, and after suffering years of physical abuse at the hands of her ex-boyfriend, Robert Hastings, she finally felt safe. Okay, he don't know where I'm at. I got away from the city. Don't nobody know where I'm at. No one. Not even, I didn't even so slide with his family members or nothing. Watson worked nights doing factory work for a temp service, and she was happy in her new home. It was perfect for me, being a senior citizen. All electric. I mean, it, it, the peoples were, were nice. Okay, they were friendly. I got a, a basket, or what they call it, a welcome basket. Welcome yes, basket. you know. And um, when they saw you new to the neighborhood, they introduced themselves and, you know, all that. I mean, it was, it was something I could deal with. I wasn't worried about nothing, nothing at all. But the abuse Watson had fought to escape would come back into her life when her ex-boyfriend was released from jail. And I heard a boom. You know, so I didn't think nothing of it. So I laid on back down. I heard another boom. So didn't think nothing of it. Then I heard my door come in. And I jumped up and I ran out the, the apartment, ran down the hall. 
to the apartment down, one of the tenants down there, and didn't know anyone in the building. I was there. I was there and didn't know anyone. But she let me in. I called 911. The woman told me to stay there until the police get there. She gave me something to put on because I only had a T-shirt on. And when the police got there, they knocked on her door, went down to my apartment, and he was sitting right there waiting on them. They said I was drunk. I just got off work. I'm in somebody else's clothes. And somebody, and I'm trying to, they didn't take him to jail. I went to jail. So I asked him to call a supervisor. I wasn't going anywhere until they call a supervisor. The supervisor told me if I clown, if I say anything, he said, I'm going to take you to, to the hospital, let them hold you for 72 hours, and then I'm going to come and get you and take, you to, take your ass to jail. Those were his exact words. Her ex-boyfriend was arrested multiple times for domestic abuse, but he would keep coming back. And she kept calling police four times between September 2011 and February 2012. Meanwhile, unbeknownst to her, the city of Maplewood was keeping a tally. And according to officials, Ms. Watson called for help too many times. It seemed like it, 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 I got pushed out for what, no reason, you know, trying to protect myself. Before we continue with Rosetta Watson's story, a few notes and reminders about Maplewood's public nuisance policy. So to even live in this community, you have to get an occupancy permit from City Hall. But you can lose this permit if the residence you're living at racks up more than two calls for service within a six-month period. It doesn't matter if those calls for service have to do with domestic abuse. And this is exactly what happened to Ms. Watson. So I got a knock at my door and the police officer delivered a yellow envelope to me saying that I have to uh, go before the board or whatever it is. And for, some, for what reason, I don't know. But I didn't know I can have a lawyer present. You know, it, I'm, I'm surrounded just like we are sitting now. I'm sitting here. I'm surrounded by all these people. Mm, I'm thinking, you got lawyers. You got the, the people, the uh, the committee, the boards, you got the police officers, you got the judge sitting at the table. I'm sitting in, you know, out there. Why come they didn't tell me I can have a lawyer? You know, I don't know. I'm, I'm only going by saying yes, sir, or no, sir, because I'm not understanding. No one is telling me, well, you don't have to answer that question on the grounds that it may incriminate you. I didn't know what was going on. And I get a phone call to say the day that I had to be out. By the end of that month, I get a check every first of the month. So uh, I told him I can't move until the first of the month. I got up, I moved, I packed my little stuff, and and I moved it. I put it in storage because I have nowhere to go then at the time. And the police officer called me and asked me, um, "Did you? Are you?" I said, "I moved." He asked me where I live at. I didn't think that was in his business. I'm not in your county no more. Even and I have doctors, I have an eye doctor that I see out there. I couldn't come back out there to see Clarkson Eye Vision Center because I'm banded and barred from Maplewood for six months. Come on now, where where you there? where they get that at? I couldn't do anything. Miss Watson lost her Section 8 voucher as a result of getting kicked out of Maplewood. And for a while, that left her homeless. I did. I lived in the vacant building. We put the bed up to the door. It was prayed and then nothing happened. Eventually, she moved back to the city of St. Louis, but she couldn't fully escape the domestic abuse. I was on the bus stop, and he found me. I didn't see him coming. And like he had done before, Hastings stabbed Watson. Instead of me, calling the police. I just went straight to the hospital. So they took pictures and everything of the stabbing. And when they took me back home, he was in my house, laying in, in, in my room in the bed. He, he, that's the thing. He, like, he sits there and he waits for them, but they don't do nothing, but they did then. Because when I went to the hospital, that's when the police were called. Hastings went to jail 
but before his case was decided, he died of natural causes. It was, it was really, really nice, peaceful, gonna be quiet. Some place where I wouldn't mind going back to. If I hadn't got this, I wouldn't mind going back out there. I think this is part of, I don't want to call it a backlash against, against uh, desegregation, but to some extent it's, it's, it's related. I mean, when, where you see these ordinances is not in towns that remain 100% white. Once again, this is Sasha Sandberg Champion, the attorney you heard from at the top of the show. And if you recall, he tracks nuisance laws at the national level. You, where you see these ordinances is in towns that are struggling with the with the growing pains of, of, of integration and people being made uncomfortable by each other. As recently as 1970, Maplewood was almost entirely white. These days, African Americans make up about 17 percent of the population. But Sasha says the town has sought ways to roll back these demographic changes and lure upscale whites back into town. It's also worth noting that two years ago, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development said that laws like Maplewoods could be problematic. And local housing advocates have brought concerns to the town officials, saying they could be violating the Federal Fair Housing Act. But Maplewood's law is still on the books. So local housing advocates say they're done with warnings and they're taking the town to courts. Next time on We Live Here. Well, I mean, I think it's been, I think it's been a very effective uh, tool for the city to to have safe, stable neighborhoods that, you know, that aren't creating problems for people that live here. We believe this policy is both dumb and unconstitutional. We Live Here is produced by me, Tim Lloyd. And me, Camille Stanley. Alana Sistrunk is our associate producer, and Robert Peterson is our boss. And from St. Louis Public Radio and PRX, this is We Live Here. Support for this podcast comes from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.